Hello everybody and welcome to another On the Workbench session. This time we're going to work on Joffrey Baratheon. This is part of that new Kingsguard box, the release from Song of Ice and Fire Miniatures game. So here's the rest of the unit here. You can see we've done the Green Stuff World texture roller basing on this. So matching up the miniatures to the movement tray. Now we've got plenty of videos on this and actually more on the way. We did some interesting thing with our banners right here. Again, this is another little piece of resin broken up terrain from Green Stuff World. You can see we've even started to paint a couple of the Kingsguard here just to get a little bit of the, the color down pack. So we're going to be doing another tutorial, obviously, on the rest of the Kingsguard. But I thought here we would mostly, mostly focus on the king himself. There's also... The banners, I'll try and do some tutorials on this too, most likely on, say, a YouTube Live session. That's all a bunch of freehand on there, so we'll show how that works too. Now, as far as the paints go, we keep things pretty simple, at least as simple as we can. And that's especially using these Reaper liner paints, so sorry for my voice. Mold and allergies and all kinds of stuff is going on. So we'll just have to bear with me on that. And we've got the blue and gray liners, also a sepia liner that I really like a lot. Very handy. Then it gets even more basic. We just have an off-white towards the bluish side. That's the maggot white over here. And then we've got the maiden flesh. It's just obviously a little bit more towards the red. Speaking of red, we got clear red here. We got the clear yellow. These are as much for skin tones as for some of the things on his vest. And we've got this golden yellow in case we need it for some trim elements for the crown. Let's go a little bit bigger with... <clears throat> now this is obviously the character card here. So we'll see just that we got some gemstones on the sword handle and hilt. Just looking here get a close look at what we've got now I've got a obviously a reference picture from the show itself too and <clears throat> believe it or not they actually are kind of more similar than they usually are what we'll do is we'll paint our base once again to match up so we've got a Sandor Clegane here this is essentially what we're looking for on our base going to do the sword in a similar way to this the cloak itself, it's not really showing too much, so I think I'm going to do the same pattern that I've done on previous. Now again, this is other stuff that I've done in tutorials here. This is something I've been doing on my Lannister cloak, so we'll probably do this freehand too. It's a simple thing, and it's something I've done on my Castle Rock Knights, done it a whole bunch of other places. By the way, I've already got tutorial on the Pyromancers, another one of those is on the way too. So you can see what that tray looks like when we've got a little bit of paint on there. So it really starts to emphasize some of the designs. As far as brushes, this is the usual too. We keep it simple again. We've got number eight round craft brushes. Now this one, when they're brand new, they tend to be more pristine. So they have a kind of a nice point on them. When they're more worn out, weathered, whatever, whatever word you want to use for it. So you can get something more like a filbert brush like this. That's handy, especially when you are painting something like, say, the base, the cloaks. In the early stages, you're going to see me using this a lot. And while it's this very large brush like this, you spin it around like so. Oh, look at that. You got a chisel edge, and that is really... That's handy for so many different things. We also have our makeup sponges right here. We use these especially in the early stages. And those early stages all about initial glazes and shaded base coat. So what we'll do is we'll get some paints out on the palette and we'll get started with that now. Just because of the mold and the fans that are going to try and get rid of the mold, paint keeps drying all the time. So while this is not meant to last from session to session, it's just to keep the paints wet during the session. This is a homemade wet palette that I did. 
top of a Chinese food container. And then, oh look, the chamois that we were using to sop up some of the water. And then some very simple basic parchment paper, like so. And all you do, got your scissors here. And we'll cut ourselves out a piece. There we go. And you want it to be a little bit smaller than the sponge, so we'll cut it like so. Then I'm going to have to round off the edges to match what you see there. And what you have to do is, I find you don't really have to soak this stuff terribly long. This is also a little higher quality parchment paper too. It's not quite just the stuff you get in the, the roll. So here we go. So we'll take out our old piece here and get the new piece in place. You can see that brings in some of the water. I turn it upside down, and now you can really see the water on there. And we'll just flatten this baby out. Let it really absorb some of that water. Now, I hadn't used a wet palette at all because, well, I just, it's not really my thing. But I kind of had to start making an adjustment. Didn't want to have to spend any money on it. Then this is basically, this is it, basically a free wet palette. If I want to cover this up, I could put the actual food container over the top of this, and then it's sealed, and boy, does it seal really good. But like I said before, not really interested in session to session. All I'm interested in is just keeping the paints going while I'm painting here. So what you can do even too with what's nice about this is you can put some water in the channel right here so you actually have a little bit of water reservoir to work from. That's kind of cool. And it also is pretty neutral. It's not all that different than say the white palette I would be using anyway. Let's get some of those liners out there. We'll start off with that initial glazes and shaded base coat that I was just telling you about. We're going to get things started with those initial glazes now. We've got our liner paints out here. We got gray, blue, sepia, brown, red liner. And the whole idea here is just to get some darker colors on this. Figure out what we want to have a little bit darker, a little bit lighter. None of this is any kind of final shading. It's just the beginning. That's all it's supposed to be. And I'm seeing him as having a pretty deep red cloak. So what we're actually going to do is take some some of the red and brown liner and we're just going to get right in here. And like I said, this has nothing to do with any kind of final final details. For those of you that are already patrons, you've seen this a bunch of times before. You know that these initial stages are, well, they look really, really messy. But the idea is you establish what you want to do quickly instead of kind of messing around for a while with not a whole lot of direction. This will get you some direction pretty quickly. See, I just grabbed some sepia liner. There's a little bit of water mixed into this. <clears throat> Again, sorry about the voice. There's a little bit of water mixed in this just to help the paint flow a little bit. Now, I know everybody's all going gagas over the GW, one of the contrast paints or whatever. In some ways, what they're talking about here is not all that different than what we're going to do here. So we're going to grab one of our sponges. Now, I've actually cut these up into some smaller pieces. What we're actually going to do is we're going to remove some of that paint. So see how we already start to get a little bit of a, not just a light and dark differential, start to get actually a little bit of color differential in there. So it actually tints these things just a little bit. Now we also have our other makeup sponge here. You can use this maybe to get, get at the more detailed areas. Now, of course, it's not as soft. So that's where some of my smaller pieces might work. And I'm just trying to get in here. 
Like I said, just remove enough of that enough of that layer just to reveal some of the shading that's there. Now as far as our base goes, we're just gonna hit it with some brown liner here. Some of the sepia liner. You can see I grab a little bit of one color here, a little bit of another color there. It doesn't have to be super precise. We're actually looking for a little bit of random. And like I said, we always have our other type of sponges here. Pull this away. One of the advantages here, just doing it like this is, well, by default, in a way, I'm getting a shadow underneath the miniature. Yeah, lighting itself is enough to get some kind of a shadow under the figure, but when you enhance that by actually adding your own shadow in there, you just get a little bit more of a benefit out of that. <clears throat> Let's throw out some of our lighter colors, like our two off-whites, Maiden Flesh and Maggot White. And then we're going to mix these with our liner paints. That's going to get us a different range of colors here. That's the blue liner right there. Let's see what happens when we mix a, just a little bit touch of the maggot white with that. So see, now we get more of a bluish gray there. And by the way, we're going to be doing some some non-metallics here, just so you know. <clears throat> I'm going to take some of that sepia liner. That's going to get mixed with a little bit of the maiden flesh there. Like so. And then we're going to start to get a little bit of a tint to our base here. We'll be working with our yellows and golds later on. The interior of that is going to get some red. Now that's one of the reasons we were using the red liner down in there. The whole idea here again is just to start to figure out what it is we're looking to do. Color-wise, lights and darks. We'll start to get a little bit of a more of a yellowish look on that sword. The shirt. I'm going to say that's a little more like a gray liner. Yeah, we'll go with... So looking at that, we'll go with a kind of a grayish look on that. And we'll get into his shirt here. It looks like the... Oh gosh, I don't know if you call it the pleats or whatever. Those are actually red. So we can get those in too. And we have a little bit of a collar there. Skin tone wise. Let's just take a little bit of the maiden flesh. A little bit of the sepia liner. Some of our red liner here. Let's just start to throw in a little bit of darker skin tone here. And you'll be amazed at how much lighter we can go with this. Now it's not really showing the trousers at all, but I'm going to go with the same thing that I just put on the shirt. And we'll go with, the, again, the the pleats in the interior, those will also have a reddish look to them. And all of this, what it does is help tie thing, tie everything together. That's the reason why I'm basically taking the liner paints and then lightening those up. And I really wish they never would have called them liner paints. I never wish they would have called those other things clear paints. Because people just get this notion that they're clear or... They're only used for lines, and you can see we're doing a lot more than just lines with these things. 
So what I will do now <clears throat> is actually inject a little bit of clear red into this. Like so. And once again, we're just taking another lighter color and mixing it in with our liner paints. You can see this is almost a little bit of wet blending that's going on right here. You get to do that when you work fast. And one of the ways you can work fast is with a bigger brush. It's one of the reasons I use these. Also, a watercolor pastel oil painter by trade and training. So I'm just kind of used to working. Working fast, working with bigger brushes. And now we let's just start to fill in some of this area around the lion motif with our darker red. Let's just get at some of these interior pleats here. And I'm not really gonna I'm not gonna sweat the, the details because remember this is just a shaded base coat. And for those not familiar with it, they say, what the heck is this shaded base coat? Well, I had to give a name. Speaking of names of paints, I had to name it something. I had to say what it was. And it really isn't just a base coat. But as you can see, it's establishing shading. And we're going to make this darker too. This is more of the brown liner. And this is a little bit of a glaze right here. I want to say it's 60% paint, somewhere in that range. And also the bracers seem to be darker here. So we'll just go with that. And the scabbard, can't really see what's all going on. We'll just, we'll make it dark and then we'll We'll add our lighter colors later. Now we also have to hit this. And there's going to be plenty of gold filigree on this. We'll hit that later. Because remember this is yeah, just supposed to be about establishing a base coat. Now I will add one other new color here. This is just a seafoam green. It's mint green. Reaper has a whole bunch of colors that are real similar to this. I'm sure other companies make colors real sim similar to that. It's basically a, some light blue and some light green sort of mixed together. I'll take that. We'll mix that with some of our some of our blue liner here. This is where some of that non-metallic metal is going to come in. See, we're just looking here. To do this top part of the blade, I just use my finger to sort of blend that. Now we're going to go on the other side of the blade. This is a warmer gray, which means it's a little more reddish. And it's got that maiden flesh in there. That's what's giving it that little bit of a warmer look. So see, we got light to dark here and dark to, light to dark this way. So we're both going kind of in opposite directions like that. Let's see if we can't do that on this side too. And here, let's. We'll probably. Eh, what the heck? We'll throw out some of the golden yellow too, just so it's out here. We'll put it over there. I think it's still. Yeah, it still shows up on the palette camera there. Because we want to get a feel for, all right, how light or dark is this sword hilt going to be? And see, I'm not really sweating again. Any kind of details here? Crown. Going to go after that, too. And I'm thinking we want the crown to be, if not lighter than the hair, make it brighter than the hair. And by that... It's just more saturated. The, the hair might be a little more dirtied up with some brown in it. Whereas the 
crown gets to be a little bit more of a pure yellow. So let's now what the the thing with the whole non-metallic deal. If you want to do gold, you you have to be careful that you don't end up with basically a bunch of nicely shaded yellow. So to prevent that, that's where you start to throw in some greens and some purples. You have to get other stuff in there to take it off of just that straight up yellow color. So we're just going to give a little bit of a yellow belt buckle and now even at this stage I'm going to take that brush see if I can't hold it at an angle and start to get some of that filigree. So here we are. See, we're going to take some of the paint away And the idea is just see if I can't pick up a few of those. A little bit of that filigree there. Because we're going to be going over it later, obviously, with some more, some more of our golds. So let's see that there. Like I said, you have to kind of be willing to start out making a mess. That's just how it is. Now let's make ourselves a skin color. It's essentially, I don't want to say red, yellow, and white, but it's pretty close to that. So what we're looking for here, I'm going to even take a little bit of that seafoam green. See how that compares to my skin tone. You can really barely see where I painted that on there. And that's the thing about skin tones. It's not hard to just mix your own. Because anything that comes in a paint jar is usually going to be too light, too dark, too red, too yellow, too whatever. <clears throat> usually just too too nuclear. I like to call it that. And the other thing too, we'll get We'll get some little bit of greenishness into the face there, but not too much because obviously we have a someone who's not quite so old and grizzled here. Now let's go a little step lighter here on some of his shirt and this. So this is where we use the brush it's got a little bit more of a point on it but because this holds so much paint I'm not constantly having to go back here to the palette it saves time and I'll later on when as we progress further with this we'll talk about the the unit painting stuff because I believe I've already done two song of ice and fire unit painting tutorials those are available on the patreon page that's the little address thing that just scrolled across the bottom of the screen right there that's just james wapple at patreon sign up for that that's where you can find out and i'm just gonna let this dry a touch so that's where you can have access to some of my other units that i've done like this one right here this is the halberdiers it's an exercise in Sky Earth non-metallic. We also did a little bit of freehand on our guard captain here. Like so right there on his cloak. So we're going to be doing, again, the same thing right here on Joffrey. This was the latest one right here. And there's your warrior sons. That was pretty tricky because... Not only did you have all the fancy basing, but you had Sky Earth, non metallic, had to be even more intense than just the regular guardsmen. But then, of course, the rainbow cloaks. Each Army Painter series, typically five episodes long, somewhere in the neighborhood of 10, 11 ish, 12 ish hours or so to work your way through the all the episodes. And it takes you from the initial basing, which is especially important with your Song of Ice and Fire stuff, because, well, so how did you get 
this thing and get the movement tray meshed in with the, the bases themselves. Well, that's all covered. That's all in there. Usually the first episode is about basing. Second episode is about painting a color test figure. Like that Kingsguard that you saw. That's well, that's sort of a test of a color test. So if, if that was an army painting series, the very next figure would be the color test. And then we'd be working our way into the whole rest of the unit. <clears throat> and I try to talk about just how much time something takes. Like right here. So how much time are we taking to paint this base? we got to figure you know, somewhere in the neighborhood of 10 minutes on the more complicated ones like this where there's just more stuff going on. So 10. Let's say you got a dozen bases. You're going to spend 10 minutes on each one. 10 minutes doesn't sound like a lot until you multiply it by 12. So now you're talking a couple of hours and you're just painting bases. If If you're looking for something like what I'm looking for, not necessarily best painted army or whatever, but just something a little bit more, something a little bit nicer. Maybe that two hours is worth it for you. Because you also have to then include, well, making the bases themselves, rolling out the Scopey, using the texture roller, breaking up all the pieces, getting them placed right. Is that worth it to you? And that's the kind of stuff that I really try to discuss pretty intensely during the army painting videos because I don't know how many times I've seen people all excited for a new army project and it lasts for a while until they start to realize, holy smokes, all that stuff that I wanted to do, that's going to take, it'll take me 20 years to paint that. And then they just basically give up on the project and that's always a sad thing to see I don't know how many projects I've seen fall by the wayside because there were thoughts of grandeur and all kinds of ambition only to find out that well yeah it's a little bit more than I wanted to get into now this may look like a dry brush it's most definitely not, because if I painted this thing heavy enough or hit the brush with this heavy enough, most of what I'm painting would all be yellow by now. The dry brush stuff <clears throat> tends to give you a grainyish look, and that's not what we're looking for. Once again, this is your, it's all about shaded base coat. Let's get into that Maiden Flash here. Actually gonna throw a little bit of a little bit of the clear red in there. Let's start to get some lights on her face. Once again, we're not worried about any kind of final blending or whatever. We're just trying to find where the lights are, where the darks are. Because the the next thing that we're gonna be getting into then is the is the middle tones. And sometimes people ask me, what the heck are the what's with these middle tones things? Well, that is that's kind of where most of the action happens with a miniature. Now it's kind of with every painting too, even if it's a two dimensional thing. It's the area halfway between light and dark. Now let's, <clears throat> on our cloak here, let's lighten this up just a touch. That was the clear red mixed in with the red liner. I want this cloak to be a darker red than some of the other cloaks that I've been doing. See how that brush flattens out? That is what helps me to get some some blending going on helps things to just get painted a little bit faster because you're you're just moving over a broader surface like so and 
you can see that while it says clear red, well, we're adding the clear red to a much darker red and it's lightening it. So if it was just it was a clear paint completely, well, it wouldn't offer any lights on our robe here whatsoever. Maybe we'll go one step closer towards the maiden flesh here. Just find a few lights on the face. And maybe we'll just go one more, one more level of our somewhat lighter red. We won't call it a highlight. We'll just this is what we're talking about midtones right here. This is it's not really a dark necessarily, but by no means is it a light. Maybe we'll work some of that red into the pleats there. I think there is no, it's not batting. There there's some there's a sewing term for it, it just escapes me right now. I'm also, just to remind myself, just throwing some red out here for some gems. I'm just assuming all these little things in here are gems. The whole idea is do this as early as you can. Just get that out there as fast as you can. I'm going to do the same thing with the sword here. That's our off-white bluish color. And our seafoam green color here. We just work the top of that sword blade. See so we can take some of that off of there. Sort of like what we did on the cloak. So we're taking some of that paint away. So there's still paint in there. It's still, still able to move that around and do stuff with it. We're doing the same thing, just on the opposite end of the sword blade there. And now, <clears throat> here on the other end of her. Now there's not quite the same sort of channel on this as there was on Sandor's sword. Here we go. So right away, that gives us a little bit of a shiny steel look right there. Let's see if we can't drop a little bit more of a light up here on the sleeves. Not so much on the pants because, well, we really want the light to hit where it's supposed to. And that is towards the top, not facing down towards the ground. And that really, some folks would be more than happy putting this out on the table just as it is. We're obviously going to be taking it much further. And we're going to start doing that with our next stage. And that's where we're going to go into the the mid-tone, start to work on our face and pull out some more details. So we'll be right back with that. So it was a little bit of a test overnight. I actually took the basically the rest of that Chinese food container here, stuck it on top of this. Yeah, I think you can see that. I mean, check that out. All of those things stayed completely wet overnight. It's like I never left this so that's just goes to show you that a uh, nice little Chinese food container can get you pretty long ways and it's very transportable too since this paint is still workable well let's let's use some of it now what we wanted to do was get in to the face some of these other mid-tone areas also play around with our sword just in general fool around with some of these things. We might even also establish our freehand design also. In fact, what the heck? 
let's start with the freehand design. Let's just go crazy here. Now, I think I've got, like I said, I've got a few examples out here. Like this, of a fairly basic pattern. Really doesn't take much to get something that looks interesting and it's repeatable across an entire army. Because I'm doing this on my pyromancers. I've got it on some of my other units that are all wearing cloaks too. So let's have a little fun with this. Now the key is to sort of start off, shall we say, more muted and then go from there. So before we get too crazy on this cloak and do a whole bunch of stuff, let's actually get the free on free end on here first. Because I, I see a lot of folks that are real timid about putting the free hand on there. And the number one reason they all give is that they're just afraid they're going to screw something up. Which is, and that that's valid. That That's completely valid. I can understand that. I think we all kind of do hesitate sometimes. Especially when you've got, I don't know, an hour and a half invested in painting a cloak. You say, well, do I really want to risk that hour and a half, and in 20 seconds, sort of blow it all up. Well, what if you were to try and do that before you've spent that hour and a half? Well, here we go. We've already set in place, set in motion, our two parallel lines here. And I might even, yeah, I can even go a little bit further with that but let's let's start going with our regular pattern that we've been doing all along and that is pretty much in the in the center of where the robe is I'm gonna do one of these sort of inverted curved diamond shapes and the idea is do this with more somewhat muted colors then it's essentially a parentheses here, followed by a straight line, followed by another parentheses, and then we start to, this is where we're repeating the design. It can be a real pain, to say the least, to do repeating designs. Now this one I've done so often, and I think you're going to see that works out pretty well as far as where it ends up. So we're, we're basically where we want to be at the end of that pattern. I'm going to do the same thing over here. And it can get a little bit tricky once you have to negotiate folds. Some cloaks, you just look at them and there's a whole bunch of folds in them and you just say, you know what? Sometimes discretion is the better part of valor. And we'll just, yeah, we'll take a pass. Now here, see, there's one of these folds. So it's a really deep fold. It's going to be really dark anyway. So all I'm going to do is just create sort of the suggestion of a pattern there. And we're just going to leave it at that for right now. Unless, what if we want to do a little more? Because this is supposed to be the king, after all. Now we've got these filigree patterns here. We even have a vague sense of some kind of antlerish type things. So I will do I'm going to add a second line to this. And this is I know it's in that pattern too. We'll even check out the reference over there on the side. So in, in a way this was my simplified version of what you see in the reference over there on the left. Sometimes even just adding a second line, just like that, can give you some really interesting results. Now, I could even do the whole lion thing back here. Do we want to do that? Oh, what the heck, let's go crazy. Now, what I'm going to do is just try and replicate what I see in the upper left-hand corner of my reference picture. So let's just do that. And i got my same yellowish colors basically in heraldic circles referred to as a rampant lion let's get his mane here 
And and you notice that this is see how it's almost a translucent color here. Now part of it is I'm trying to sketch this in. Another thing is to it's well it's the shading of it as well. And the the knee should go like that. Okay, I think we've got this pretty well established here. We need a tail like so. Let's get the there's your main, and it goes like that. And at this stage, I can also, for lack of a better, lack of a better expression, just erase something if I don't like it. But it is usually it's not a bad idea. Do this sooner rather than later because this is where you decide. Ah, eh, you know, it's just it's a little too much. I don't really need it there. Or you say, actually, yeah, that could almost be brighter or whatever. Now maybe we can even fool around with a few additional decorations here. So I am going to, in these corner slots here, do another little bit of decoration there. And then have a little bit of a curved design emerge from that. I'm going to do that over here too. And actually I'm going to have it attached to this line instead. So the nice thing is, remember, it's the whole idea of doing this sooner rather than later. And I can even have something that comes down from here. And also maybe has some kind of an arcing little piece of filigree there. So now see it started to reflect what's in there. And maybe we just leave this as it is and we start to work in other areas too. All we tried to do, that whole little episode right there, all that was about was just trying to establish, well, is that where... Do we want that there? Now let's get into here. So I'm going to do also here is, is a couple of some darker glazes after I reinforce. I'm going to go after some of this filigree here. And it's almost a little bit brighter than I would normally paint it because well, we're going to do some of those darker glazes over the top. So hopefully the voice is a little bit better. It's still going to be a little gravelly at this point, I would, I would say. Now we got some of that yellow with the non-metallic stuff. You want to try and reflect as many things as you can. I've actually seen Believe it or not, sword hilts that, or sword hilts and handles that reflect onto the sword hilt slash handle itself. I've, I've seen it, definitely seen that happen. Let's get a few lights here into our crown. Because we're going to, once again, we're going to do some glazes over the top of this too. And some of this is a bit of a continuation of that whole sheeted base coat notion. And we'll get some here. Now I may actually go to a slightly different brush here. Now you notice the one thing that I haven't put out here at all is white. That is something that I basically save until sort of that last segment because as soon as you start throwing white around you, you can't go any lighter than that so it's best to try and build up as many lights as you can before you get yourself stuck into using white so let's get some eyes in here just like so now, I may sometimes have to turn this where it's hard for you to see because I just I gotta be able to hold the brush 
I'll get his other eye in here. There we go. Now remember we were talking about not quite as much emphasis on, say, that whole greenish 5 o'clock shadow type of deal. Because he is a little bit fresher faced, shall we say. Well, okay. Instead of maybe some of that green, I'm going to take something that's a little bit more on the pinkish side here. Start to fill in a couple of areas here with that. And then we're going to lighten that up from there. Now, we don't want to give him rouge. But if he's supposed to be younger and he's got this whole grizzled beard looking like he belongs to the Night Watch or something like that, well, then we've kind of, we haven't quite registered our point there. So let's just get some of that a little bit lighter. That's another thing that I learned this in, in portrait painting. You can age a person really, really, really quick by really emphasizing strong shadows on their face. Now, that's one way if you want to flatter somebody. I found this out doing portraits. You want to kind of make them feel better about themselves. You de-emphasize those shadows, and all of a sudden, they look 5, 10, 15 years younger because you're just... You're not emphasizing all of those, say, the lines of age. So you're even throwing a little bit of that red over there onto those skin tones. And I can say I'm going to change the position of this eye. Now, by doing this early, it's kind of like the freehand. You do this early, you have more room for maneuver later on. It's almost like you're doing a Tyrion type of thing and you're a master of maneuver. Or you're doing a Stark thing and you're jumping on that maneuver zone. And boy, while well, speaking of maneuvers, that new Targaryen starter box, the, the all-cav starter box, I think what may happen is people might start playing on 6x4 tables. Instead of just 4x4. Four Because four. that's... When I get down to my battle reports... You know, plenty of people are playing on 4x4 four four tables. I mean, just basically would be repeating what you're already seeing at that point. So my goal with my battle reports is to do something a little more epic sized. Say 50 point games. Maybe even a 60 point game. Now, before you say, oh my gosh, it's going to be 3 hours long. Well... When you emphasize, if it's a unit of warrior sons and a unit of King's Guard and Castle Rock Knights, well, <laughs> those 50 or 60 points go real quick. So it's not necessarily about having a thousand units on the table. It's just making things maybe a little more challenging for cavalry, but then really challenging for regular infantry. So here's some of that. This is some of the brown liner. We're going to take some of our uh, maiden flesh. Here, we're going to go even more into the brown liner. Basically trying to make a warm gray. And what we're trying to do here, we're going to put in a little bit. I'm just going to work on my focus here. And this is what I mean about it's easier. See how we're putting that dark in there now? Here, let's turn them around. Hopefully this will work out this way too. Can you see them? Just about. And it almost looks like he's got himself some eyeliner going on. So maybe, what the heck, we do a little bit of that. So the idea is you put in your eyes almost larger than they're supposed to be. And then you... For all intents and purposes, you gotta just pick away at them. And how that sounds weird, but it is a whole lot easier than trying to get that painted just right. Here, let's let's do this eye right here. Just make sure we get the whole eye in there. 
Like I said, I can go in here. See, and then basically go after sort of the underside part of that eye. Let's give him some some lips here. Because this is supposed to be about working on the face, so let's work on the face. So we give him a little bit of a stronger upper lip there. And sometimes when when they have things that's a strong feature like that, you can sometimes even give them a little bit of an expression, I suppose. Here, let's... Now, while I've got that brown liner, while I'm thinking about it. I'm going to, over here on the sword, just give that a little emphasis of a of a dark there just in that one spot let's get the that blood groove the channel in there now I'll take this let's do a few a few little glazes over the top of this see all of a sudden now our, our filigree sort of starts to emerge also starts to shade the jerk in a little bit. I'm, I'm assuming this is kind of a sewn type of thing, and that's what we always call them at our Ren Fear events and, and such, so I'm going to go with that too. But you can see, sorry, I smashed into the camera there. For those of you that like I said, aren't too familiar with these, it's real close quarters here. I mean, there is a half an inch between the miniature and the pallet cam. There's about a quarter of an inch between the end of my brush and the main camera. That's just sort of how it goes with trying to film stuff. There's never an easy way to set this stuff up. It's usually just varying degrees of hard. So the hand here, we're going to get some definition between the fingers. And sometimes with these figures, as much as I love these, sometimes mold lines can be in weird places. Now, what we can do, I'm going to get <clears throat> just a little bit more of this red liner out here. Not red liner, clear red. Let's see if we can't make ourselves a bit of an orange. So that's that sort of golden yellow there. And this there's a nice little orange. I mean, I could go buy it jar orange paint or I could just kind of make my own and I now I know that every time I take clear red and that golden yellow I can make myself essentially an orange now I'm not seeing the whole bunch ah, see, I am seeing a few gemstones in my in the card the character card not seeing any gemstones in the crown on the TV show. This is where I've kind of got to make a decision. So why do I stick more closely to the what's going to be in the game versus the show? And that's what I've been doing for the most part, so maybe I just stick with that. So it would seem there is a gemstone here. Another one maybe here. See what happens when we throw one on either side of that over here and here. I even make that one a touch bigger. And speaking of gemstones, while we got the red, this all sort of falls under the general category of mid tones, I suppose. Let's see if we can't get ourselves. A little bit of a gemstone effect. Now the the super quick and easy way is just to say do what I've done here is get a the the darks on there and get a touch of a lighter color like that, and then you can hit them with anything that is some kind of a, a water effects. Oh gosh, what's the GW thing called? Art coat and anything that's glossy, clear and glossy. You hit them with something like that. 
And lo and behold, it puts that little highlight dot on there for you. You don't have to paint it on there. Better yet, that light, that little highlight moves with your light source. And that's probably what I'll do here. So I'm just imparting a little more of this clear red in some spots here. Let's let's get the base. And I'm not worried about what's hitting the line itself because I can always go over that now. Don't want to go too crazy with the red on the base because it is supposed to be sort of a worn, broken tile floor. Not something we just went to the tile store and bought. I'm gonna this is where I try and get a few few colors that are just a little bit lighter in here into some of these pleats or slats. I used to know what the heck these were called. Cause again, I used to have to invest in these sort of clothes because we used to used to sell art at a Renaissance fair. And we needed at least two or three different outward outfits for the stuff. Used to actually have some leather armor. That was fun. Maybe not so much on a really warm day. Well, actually, none of the costumes were very fun to wear on super warm days. Yeah, let's see. We do. We go one step. One step closer to yellow orange here some of these gemstones now, I said the whole thing that gives a gemstone that that look is that light to dark usually light at the bottom because the light is sort of transferring through that and then your a little bit of a highlight there right on top of that darker area and it's pretty neat how just doing that little bit of glossiness there can really make that show up okay that, that helps those out just a little bit I'm even going to throw a touch of this here onto that jerk in there now I am I do need to throw out some white here. I just want it for the eyes. I want those to be as strong as possible here. And it's just straight up white. Nothing fancy. Let's get some of the excess off of there. And right there. Let's see if we can do it on the other side. Like so. And maybe even a hint of it in a few areas on the, the face. And maybe a few spots here. Well, you got the buckle here. Now his shirt really doesn't, to me, appear to be white at all. It seems like it's a light gray. But we're going to get ourselves a few more, few more lights on that as well. And all I did was I just took a little smidge of that white color there. And then put it on over the sleeves now. And I've got that out there. Let's see what we can do with our freehand design. Yeah, I'm going to... Might even try and make that a little bit bigger. So here we go. So let's make that bigger. And let's... Let's see if we can't start to replicate that a little more. So I've got to make sure that this arm crosses over in front here. 
and then we've got this leg you got to be out in front the tricky thing here is that this tail mostly falls in a shadow so we don't want that getting too bright and now again the face mane you could even say paint this on a flat surface somewhere else until you maybe feel a little bit more confident about how you're going to be able to paint that it, it's essentially sort of a muscle memory type thing and we will see we can start to add in some of these some of these lighter tones here that starts to create more definition for the main the tail and none of this is a final none of this is final yet we can alter this we can tone it down if we want Because remember, if this is, and this is why I do the, um, with the army painting stuff, I'll say there's maybe some things you just reserve for special characters. And I think so far I have not. I was thinking of doing on, say, Jamie Lannister. Now, here, look, I was just about to put a really bright yellow on that part of the cloak, and that wouldn't have made a whole bunch of sense. So let's start to. Let's start to work on our original little freehand design here. Now let's do that. And if you check out the YouTube live session I did of the Knights of Castlery Rock, you'll see I did something real similar to this. And that was across the entire unit. All of their cloaks all got this treatment. And like I said, if this ever gets too bright, can always tone it down later. All I gotta do is just throw a little bit of a glaze over the top of it. That's all it'll take to tone it down. So in some ways, these little swirls here, they mimic the lion's tail so you notice we're just we're not getting too light with these freehand patterns that are supposed to be in shadow that's why we do that sort of initial layer in that darker tone Let's go one more step. With that let's let's say, make this line a little more complete here. Let's get let's get to some of these filigree patterns up here. Now there's some of this stuff where I just have to hold it in a certain way, and it'll be virtually impossible for you to see what I'm doing. I try to make sure that as close to a hundred percent of the painting process is recorded. Don't really, to me, there's not a whole lot of value in all of a sudden you see me come back and oh presto, it's all painted, yay! I don't know that that doesn't seem terribly helpful. That's why I try and show every brushstroke. I know the videos get a little longer as a result of that, but to me. It, it's worth it because people will just end up asking the, that question anyway. Now, we're also going to try and complete some of this. like to do these little connect the dot sort of things like this. And we can always we can take it a, a one step further than that. So where's our line? Just looking for my reference over there. Again, we'll emphasize the main. I 
We'll emphasize some of these more prominent parts of the cloak here. Now let me show you what I meant about just toning some things down. Okay, so we got our sepia liner, right? Got a little bit of brown liner here. We'll make ourselves a bit of a glaze. And you can see it doesn't take much. See how that already starts to tone down stuff that maybe I thought was a little too bright. You can do this as many times as you want. And that tail starts to recede more into the backdrop. There was another little thing that I did on a recent miniature with freehand. And I was essentially, I made little dots in there. And I made it almost look a little bit like it was embroidered. So let's see if we can. I'm going to try and take some sepia liner and some of that maiden flesh. I'm going to try and find some lighter tones in the hair. And then I'll, I'll do it for this particular segment because I try to keep these at a certain length. So what we'll do is we'll Throw in, well, actually, may I just try and do the? Uh, now we'll do the eyes in the next segment. No, no point in rushing that. No point in getting too too far out ahead of ourselves. So just gonna do that. So let's yeah see. So that's where we got that that gemstone there. I know you can't see my cursor. I'm just. Looking at this, see what I got. I'm going to make this thing smaller again. Then what we'll do in the next segment, we're going to do some eyes on them, finish off the base, start to really add in some of our pizzazz, some of our stuff on the sword here. Maybe add a few more highlights to our freehand design on the back of the cloak, clean that up, and some of the little filigree patterns here. So we'll be... Right back with that. So let's try to get into some of our final painting details here. Now before I mess around with the sword, I'm going to see if I can't get in just a few final, few final things on my gemstones here. And what I am looking to do is add a couple of lighter, lighter spots here at sort of the very bottom like so like that and what I'll do to lighten these things up or give it that that glossiness that we we're talking about I've got I'll probably use the secret weapon water effects that's the same stuff that I use for the snow so you guys would be familiar with that and you could use Vallejo, any kind of, there's a million different little gloss gels and, and such things that are out there. You could, any one of those will do the trick. Doesn't have to be something super fancy. And, again, I don't quite know what the design is on here. I'm going to assume it's something uh, between antlery and filigree we'll just how's, how's that <laughs> how's that for a definitive non-answer I'm gonna take a little bit of this I have that blue there let's see if I can get a little more say lighter color on the boots you could do mud spatter on your boots that will make them look neat I had thought about doing that I might I think I did some of that on the Night's Watch that I did. That was another one of my Patreon army painting series. And that was another one that took you through the entire process of basing, through that whole sort of messier shaded, shaded base coat phase, and all the way on through 
to have the final snow effect. I'm also going to be doing a Scorpion Builder Crew. If you check out the blog, and I, I can link that too in the description here along with the Patreon page for you. That is something I'm also going to do. It may be two or three parts. One part obviously is going to be all about the basing. Because I had a lot of fun with that. As you can see, all of a sudden this stuff, couldn't even see it before. Now it gets to be a little bit more prominent. That's why I try and build all this stuff up. So like Monopoly, try and build as evenly as possible. I know there's folks that want to essentially paint the whole face and then nothing else. Well, it can lead to some issues because your skin tone might look a little bit wacky. Because you've painted nothing around it. Let's say you got black primer around it. Everything looks light next to black. So as soon as you give him some light here, well, guess what? That's going to start looking just a little bit funky. Now, let's see. It's going to be a kind of a delicate thing here to drop these eyes in. Now, i got some blue liner here on the brush. And the idea is you want to have them looking off in the right direction. So let's have them looking off to the these cameras left here. So there's one eye right there, I think. You can see that. Let's see if we can't get the other one to do the same thing. Now, sometimes it takes a few attempts to get that just where you want it. But you can see he's sort of looking off this way now. He's got a bit of a stern look on his face. Now, we've got our here we got our white here let's get a few brighter things here on our sword let's get that channel that groove with a little more of a highlight on it let's get this top side of the blade with a little more of a highlight on it let's get to some of our gold accents here on this handle. Another thing with the whole non-metallic stuff is if you highlight things in more of a I don't want to say it in points but if it's not one long continuous stroke but almost a little bit like the these glinting highlights where it's just a dot here and there as opposed to a whole long line. Sometimes that can be pretty effective too. And up here, just trying to find a few areas where we can get just a little separation there. Not too much. You don't want to highlight this as brightly as we're highlighting, say, metal surfaces, because then they just won't quite look metal anymore. But let's, let's find something that's more of a sky blue color. At, all right, something like this. It's verdigris blue. I've used it in a bunch of other videos too. I'll just slap this over here. And we'll mix it with our seafoam green. Just gives it a touch of sky color. And we're just going to throw that right in here. Maybe even a touch on that side. So that looks like maybe a little bit of the sky is being reflected. Another thing that's also fun is to go a bit on the purple side. So let's see if we can't make ourselves a purple instead of having to put one out there. This will be somewhat of a reddish purple here. And I do this on a lot of my sword blades and armor. I think just about every single time. Does it really register as purple when people are looking at it? That's sort of the key thing. And we're going to start throwing that in a few other areas. You say, wait a minute, purple in the hair? Nobody's ever even going to think that's purple. 
think the eye is just going to register that as some kind of brownish gray. Because actually, well, purple and green together make a really nifty gray, which is why the eye kind of, by on its own, translates that into a gray. Here, let's do something with the underside of this sword hill. I don't even know if you can see it. That's I'm not gonna yeah, some of these things it's, is it really that important for you to see how I paint the underside of the sword hilt? I think the other stuff is definitely more important for you to see. Crown is definitely gonna need a few of these lighter highlights. Yeah, let's back him out a little bit. And this is why I've been saving this all this time. And then if you're if you put it the brightest highlight down, they say, Oh my god, that didn't really do a whole bunch. That's just a sign that around it there's not enough dark. And you can always go back in and do a glaze or something or whatever and, and just get a little more dark added in there. Like I said, I could spend, if this was, say, a commission thing or something, I would be spending hours in addition to what you're seeing here. But for a lot of you that are just you're looking to have this in a unit and play it with for games, maybe you don't have quite the time to do something like that. Well, this should be more than adequate, I believe, especially since... This entire video probably is going to be less than well short of two hours long. So if the one of the centerpieces of your army only takes you an hour and a half to get to this point, well, then that is not necessarily time poorly spent. Now let's get in. Here, I'll take some of that red liner. Try and get some of yellow in there. Let's see if I can't infuse a little bit of my homemade purple into my golds because that's something I really like to do. Yeah, let's do that here too. Get in the hair. Just trying to get some separation. Actually, purple and orange are nice opposites to each other so that sort of cranks up your contrast level by default now let's uh, see we add a little bit of that lighter color to our purples here and wind like that so we get this nice little transition that happens there might even just grab a little bit more of my white here. And this way I can do a couple of more of these brighter areas. And heck, you could even do the little highlight dot in the eyes if you want. It's something I used to do more of in the past. I do that a little bit less now. Because at this size, it starts to be a little bit on the artificial side. Or scale, I guess you want to call it. So once again, I'm just looking for a few. To get a few of these little highlights in on my golds. And this way now I can maybe even... On the lion, find a few brighter zones here. On his shoulder, over this arm. On some <clears throat> parts of the filigree here. Since I had tone those down. Sometimes you, you tone things down and that way you can bring them back a little bit. Maybe I even 
No, I don't want to get too crazy with highlights in the here. I'll just do do a couple here. Sometimes the hardest here to deal with can be stuff like this, where it's kind of on the curly side, but it's very short curls, and they kind of they're kind of flopping around all over the place here. And sometimes I add in a little additional freehand elements, maybe, just to give it a little more of a regal appearance, maybe, perhaps. Now let's see, let's see about our base here. We've left this alone for a while because we've been focusing on the more important stuff. The figure itself, you don't necessarily want the base to overpower the figure and in this case where it's part of an entire unit you also don't want the unit basing to overpower the figures in the unit and if, if you're wondering now why I did here the the lion on his cloak well we've got it here on the base it could be really interesting that then subsequently represent that on the cloak. Now I can get some of these a little bit lighter, but like I said, I wanna don't want to get too crazy too fast with the lights on on this base. Cuz it is supposed to have sort of a worn worn out look to it. But it's nice when you just See this area here, the lighter it leads you into the figure itself. It's almost like a little bit of an arrow pointing at the figure. Say, look at this dude. Now here on the back, be less, not so much working on lighter things, but maybe this is where I throw in a few more, say, glazes. Heck, I could even use weathering powders. It's all kinds of stuff I could use to indicate, say, that he's casting a shadow on there or just a little bit of wear and tear on the bases. I think I used to do the weathering powder on the bases more back in the day. Uh, maybe I'll get back into it again. Just trying to, I say, find some more. Highlights here. Now the one thing that we don't really have a whole bunch of on here is some kind of some sort of green. So let's just find something here. And this is another one of the Reaper clears. It's clear green. You say, whoa, wait a minute. What's going on with that? Not a bunch. Not going to use a whole lot of it, but we're going to find a few places to inject this. And you're going to see it's not a terribly intense green whatsoever we've really graded it down but I'm just gonna throw that into because some parts of this just I saw a gray or a greenish a little bit of a greenish tint in the card art there remember red and green are opposites and it's a way to get a little bit of stealthy contrast I'm even gonna throw some of that in the hair I'm gonna use a little bit of it on the boots like this. I'm just trying to get that in a good spot for you to see it. So see right in there. Even here on his pantaloons. Because sorry puffy pants or pumpkin pants or whatever are not pants. They're I just call them pantaloons can even get a little more of a lighter touch on that greenish tone there. It's a little bit of a color surprise. Heck, I'm even going to start putting it down here on the base because I've used that on some of the stones on the other bases, throwing a little bit of green down there. Like I said, it doesn't necessarily register as green when people look at it. 
All they notice is that there's a contrast to it. Even going to throw some here. Like so. Even get some here. It's a little bit important too because, well, typically you're looking at the sky or whatever, it's got some kind of a bluish tone to it. It's a way to maybe get a little bit of the sky color in on these leathers here. And I'm not thinking that it's metal. That surface doesn't seem to be metal. I mean, I could be completely wrong. I could talk to the folks that sculpted this. Say, was your intention to have that be metal? And you can see, I just see it now at this point, because we have that strong base, I'm even going to get a little bit of that greenish coat here in the skin tone. Because of that solid infrastructure we made with all that crazy stuff early on with the, the liner paints and the glazing and the wiping away of the stuff that looked so, looked kind of horrible and nasty at the time. That's the kind of stuff that we have now spent the last, oh, what, a hour and something, maybe, building off of here. Like I said, that little, that bit of green, you couldn't even, you don't even really know it's there when, when you look at this stuff. You can't hardly even tell that we added anything that's remotely green, but it's there. And I might even... Get a little bit of that on some of the skin tone there. Maybe even a little bit on my golds. A little bit on the scabbard here. And maybe even some brighter highlights on the pants here. Oh, pantaloons. Sorry, not going to let them say their pants. And a couple more. couple more highlights here so what we'll do is we're gonna let this let this set for a few minutes here and then I'll, maybe I'll bring out a couple of different glossy type things some of that art code and some of the secret weapon water effects I believe it's called realistic water is the actual name of that because in, in some parts of the world apparently it's hard to get secret weapon stuff or whatever so that's why I try and present as many options as possible so we'll be right back with that in just a second so we were talking about getting a little bit of a gloss effect here on some of our gemstone type things now there's a couple of there's so many of these out there, but here's just a couple. So you got the GWR code stuff, you got the realistic water from Secret Weapon. And let's say we just throw out a little bit of the art code stuff. I mean, it's kind of both the a similar thing. Now the Secret Weapon stuff, that's what I like to use with my snow effect. And we'll talk about that in a little bit. Let's just... Here we go, get that where you can see it. And the idea is, well, gemstones are on the glossy side anyways. And what that'll do is, it'll present you with that little tiny dot sharp highlight thing. And this way, you don't have to try and paint that in. Again, it's just a slightly easier way of doing that. See if we can. Yeah, just a couple little dots of that. You could use, again, the secret weapon stuff. Here, let's get some of that. And when it says, do not shake, you don't shake it. So that's why we wrote that on there, because that's a little bit <laughs> a little small right there. So any of you guys that have seen the any of the episodes where I'm basing stuff with snow effects, you've seen this stuff in play. 
Let's see, there we go. We'll just let that dry, see how that works. Now, the whole notion of painting this cloak, I've done a lot of it on the Lannisters, but I've got some more tutorials coming up for those of you that like your Starks. So this is another tutorial that I'm working on here. You can see it's the same idea here, except now it's a wolf motif and the knotwork is a little more squared off. So this is the same kind of thing, but like I said, I've got a tutorial underway for this. I've got a few tutorials already on the mountain. Now we're working on this one here. So this is the alternate sculpt, Gregor Clegane right here. See, we did the same thing on the sword blade there. Now his head's a little bit bigger, so we're able to do some more stuff there. Now also working on some tutorials for Varus here. You can see we've got some purples in there, some blues. So this is the kind of stuff that I like to do. This is where we're playing around with the colors a little bit more. Now, also going to work on a, I think this is your Tywin Lannister right here. This is probably the one other character that I might use that same lion motif on the cloak. Now, gets a little dicey up here because you can see this is more compressed. This is what I was talking about with those folds before. Whereas this cloak here, we had more of an open space to work with. So I'm still going to try and put this on here, I think. I think that'll just be, that'll be kind of fun. Give him a little bit of a little extra. Like I said, we also got tutorials coming up on the King's Guard here to get us this whole porcelain alabaster type effect. See the purples and greens again. You don't necessarily see those until they're pointed out. Like this is a very, it's almost like a pinkish purple right over there. But it's also next to this sort of lime green. And the idea is that those two sort of play off of each other and they they kind of negate each other in a way. <clears throat> Even on the helmet, I've got purple and green right next to each other. But again, the base motif, still the same. Now, some of these will be on YouTube Live. I've also, as I got more pyromancers going, I also have somewhere in here, uh huh, my crossbowmen. This is another tutorial coming up. So, once again, you've got the non metallic metal there. Now, if you do sign up at that $15 a month Army Painter pledge level that you've seen floating across the screen, that will get you things like here, where you see a whole unit. From the basing stage all the way through. Now this one happened to be painted in oils. Actually, I think you can see some of these on my YouTube live sessions. And we'll certainly be doing more of these. Because I've got like four, three more of this unit alone to paint. Plus spear wives. Plus the cave dweller savages. And I've got some of those over here. Here we go. So this is another set of tutorials that's coming. These were sort of my color test figures on that. So we'll be doing some more of these guys. And as soon as you sign up to that Army Painter Pledge level, you're going to get about... I don't want to tell you how many hours of videos you're getting because you might just be too scared. But needless to say, you'll be getting about 80, 80 plus videos, I would say, straight off the bat. So like I say... Even if you don't sign up for the Patreon thing, maybe if you can do me a favor, just do a like on the video here and sign up and be a subscriber to the YouTube channel. Because that's when you get notifications about those YouTube lives, some of the other neat stuff that's coming up. So yeah, see that's... Ah yeah, I can even see right now. Yeah, here, I'm going to get this closer and I'll ch change the focus here. Yeah, I think you can see... A little dot right there, but that dot moves. So I, I noticed just as soon as you start painting those dots on there, well, they don't move anymore. They're static. They're stationary. And sometimes that doesn't work too well when it's on the tabletop. Maybe it works with photography. See here, I actually got a couple of dots on the one that's on the sword hilt there because I've got about six lights pointed at this thing. So the, in any case, thanks again for watching. I really appreciate that. Hopefully this... Even if you just get one or two helpful hints out of this, anything, 
should help you and get your own Warrior's Son slash Kingsguard Lannister slash Song of Ice and Fire figures painted. Thanks again, and I will catch you on the next episode.